Good morning, good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon. Welcome to this session, first session about computer science and computer engineering. Uh, and the topic of this session is uh, artificial intelligence and computer engineering. Uh, now we will have uh, six uh, works that we will present here. And uh, you will have uh, 12 to 15 minutes to present. Okay. And after that, we you will have uh, five minutes, more or less, okay, for the uh, round of questions, okay. Um, the first work is, is, is by Martínez Ríos, Barín Dos Torres, and Bustamante Bello. And uh, they will uh, present payment transverse cracking detection based on the vehicle's vertical acceleration performed via transfer learning and wavelength scattering skate transform. Okay, and so uh, if you're ready, Eric Axel, uh, you will have the microphone now to, to start uh, your okay. presentation, please. Uh, okay, uh, let me uh, share the, the script. Let me a moment, please. Uh, can you see my, my presentation? Uh, could you see my presentation in the in the screen? Uh, could you see my presentation on the in the screen? Yeah. Presentation on the in the screen. Yeah. Presentation on the in the screen. Okay. Uh, well. Uh, well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Eric Martinez. Uh, the title of this presentation is Pavement Transverse Tracking Detection Based on the Vehicle's Vertical Acceleration, Performed via Transfer Learning and the Wavelet Scattering Transform. Uh, this is for the 20th International Conference on Electrical Engineering, Computing Science, and Automatic Control. Uh, so the outline of this presentation is as follows. Uh, first, I will make a brief introduction about the topic. Uh, then I will talk about the materials and methods, uh, the results, and the conclusions of this study. So first of all, it is important to, to consider that any difference or departure from the normal state of the road is referred to as a road surface anomaly. These road surface anomalies can include uh, the presence of potholes, cracks, or routing in the road surface. And the traditional method in which the road uh, surface is assessed is through a pavement condition index service. Nevertheless, these services are susceptible to human errors, inefficient, and can, and can put at risk the road technician's health. Uh, taking this context into account, uh, in the literature, we can find works that have proposed to use uh, or develop systems that can detect and classify these road surface anomalies by employing either vision-based techniques or vibration-based techniques. In the case of vision-based techniques, uh, the authors mainly empl employ computer vision and image processing algorithms to develop these systems that can automatically detect and classify these road surface anomalies. And nevertheless, one of the problems that vision-based techniques has is that it requires specific hardware to perform the processing of the video or the camera uh, data. On the other hand, we can find works that have proposed to use vibration-based techniques. In this regard, uh, the authors use acceleration data of the vehicle in order to associate, associate this acceleration data with a specific road surface anomaly. This is typically done by employing signal processing techniques and machine learning in order to find features that can help us to classify the vibration data into the different road surface anomalies. So in this case, this study is focused on how we can use uh, vibration data to detect uh, these uh, road surface anomalies. So what is the problem of the solutions that have been focused on using machine learning to perform this road surface anomaly detection? Well, the main problem of machine learning is that you need a large quantity, a large quantity of, of training that data to, be, to use machine learning effectively. Nevertheless, uh, 
the data collection could be time consuming, inefficient, and unrealistic. So the question is, well, how can we learn from small sample sizes? No? How can we use these machine learning techniques when we have a relatively small sample size? In the context of broad surface anomaly detection, while it could be unrealistic to collect samples of every type of broad surface anomaly that could have different kinds of geometries, and also the vibration signals produced by the vehicle could change due to the vehicle speed, the dynamic characteristics of the vehicle, and the way in which the accelerometer is placed on the vehicle. Now, these are factors that can increase the variability of the distribution of the signals that we want to classify. So the problem is, well, how can we still learn something from the data with a small sample sizes, or which techniques are available that can help us to deal with this problem? So in this study, uh, what we proposed was to compare two techniques uh, that have been used effective, uh, that have been used in the past to learn from the small sample sizes. Uh, the first one is transfer learning, and the second is a scattering transform, or the wavelet scattering transform. Uh, for the case of transfer learning, we basically use pre-trained convolutional neural networks, in particular the squeeze net. And for the scattering transform, we apply this transformation to the acceleration data to obtain what, are, what they call the scattering features to train, in this case, a more simple classifier that was a regularized linear discriminant analysis. Uh, to validate this process, well, we employ the data set collected by Xu that can be consulted in reference five of this, of this presentation. Basically, this data set consists of sensing the vehicle's vertical acceleration of the vehicle while it travels over the road surface. In this case, the accelerometer was placed in the tires in the tire suspension knuckle of the vehicle. And also the characteristics of this data set is that we have a total sample size of 327 samples. Uh, in this case, we selected this data set due to its, due to its small sample size. Uh, and also it is important to mention that from the total sample size, 33% of the data were signal segments associated with pavement transverse cracking. And the 67% of the data set was used for, well, what related to signal segments associated with uncracked pavement. Uh, based on this data set, well, uh, we, we process the vertical acceleration data in order to associate, associate this acceleration data into the different, into pavement transverse cracking and uncracked pavement. So for the transfer learning, uh, well, in this case, we opted to, to use transfer learning because it has been used uh, in the past to use a predefined network architecture as a starting point for learning a new classification task. Uh, that is, it has been shown that it's more easier and faster to use this pre-trained architecture uh, uh, from the start than randomly initializing the weights of the network. Uh, moreover, uh, we can use we can transfer the alert features to a new classification task with fewer training some images in this case or samples. That is one of the main reasons that we decided to employ this methodolo methodology. In particular, uh, we selected the squeeze net uh, to perform these tasks. Uh, we selected this neural network based on the number of layers and its number of parameters that in this case was 18 and 1.24 million parameters. In this case, this network requires to have an input image. Uh, well, a size of the, the size of the input image should be of 227 times 227 pixels. And we uh, fine tune this uh, neural network using an NVIDIA GPU with the characteristics that can be appreciated in this section. Uh, a little bit about the, the architecture of the squeeze net. Well, the squeeze net is composed of a fire model. The fire model basically consists of two layers. One is called the squeeze layer that consists of one times one convolution filters. And the expansion layer is, it consists of one times one and three times three convolution filters that are applied to the input data in parallel. The squeeze net allows us to reduce the number of parameters of the input data and the expand layer, what allows us is to 
uh, learn multi-scale features no? or it, learn features from different scales of the input image. So by taking this into account, what Wavelet CK did was to apply the Wavelet transform to the acceleration data to generate a scalagram that serves as an input image to the neural network. And with this scalagram, we fine tune the pre-trained convolutional neural network. And for this purpose, and, to, and, for, and for assessing the generalization performance of the network, we apply a five-fold cross-validation strategy. Uh, in figure three, you can appreciate the scalagram that we generated from, from the acceleration signals. In the left, you can observe the scalagram of a vehicle vertical acceleration signal associated with uncracked asphalt pavement. And in the right, you can observe the vehicle vertical acceleration, the scalagram of a vehicle vertical acceleration signal associated with cracked asphalt pavements. And this is where basically the images that we generated to, to fine tune the, the neural network. And well, in general, well, this is where this is, these were the results that we obtained by performing five-fold cross-validation. In this regard, uh, we obtained an uh, average validation sensitivity of 84%, an average validation specificity of 92%, and, a validation, and, uh, and an average validation AUC of 94.97%. Also, the training time by employing the GPU that I mentioned before was of 2.65 minutes. Okay, in the case of the scattering transform, uh, well, this algorithm was proposed by Stefan Malatz. And the main question that he wanted to answer uh, when, when developed this method is how signals should be represented for classification. So to answer this question, the scattering transform, what it does is to create a representation that is invariant to translation and stable to small town wrapping deformations. And by doing this, we hope that we can reduce the within class variance of the set of signals. And hopefully, maybe we can apply a linear classifier that can allow us to discriminate between the two, the two groups that we wanted to compare. Other properties of the scattering transform is that it is a constructing operator, it preserves the energy, and it is stable to small town wrapping deformations. Okay. And also we we use uh, for this technique uh, a CPU of the following characteristics. Uh, this is a schematic representation of the scattering transform. Basically, it consists of a cascade of convolution with wavelets, uh, nonlinearities applied through the modulus operation, and uh, pooling or convolutions with the scaling functions. In general, uh, this technique can be compared with a convolutional neural network. In the sense that we are applying a we are applying a, we are applying a convolution to the input image or signal, but in this case we are not learning the filters. The filters are fixed and they are wavelets that are dilated in frequency, and the result is is uh, transformed again with a nonlinearity that in this case is a is a complex modulus. And the result of this complex modulus is convolved again with the help of a scaling function that is similar to what uh, of the pooling operation of the convolutional neural networks. So basically, well, we apply this scattering transform to the vehicle vertical acceleration signal. We train the regularized linear discriminant analysis with the obtained coefficients from the scattering transform. And again, we apply a five-fold cross-validation to assess the generalization performance of the network. Uh, in figure five, you can observe the obtained scattering coefficients. Uh, in this case, in blue, you can observe the scattering coefficients of a vehicle vertical acceleration signal associated with transverse cracking. And in red, you can observe the scattering coefficient of a vehicle vertical acceleration signal associated with uncracked pavement. So these were basically the features or the coefficients that we used to train the linear discriminant analysis. In total, they were 14 coefficients. And the results that we obtained were the following. Uh, they can be observed, observed in, in table three. In this regard, in terms of sensitivity, we obtained an average uh, validation sensitivity of 67%, an average validation specificity of 78%, 
and an average validation AUC of 80%. And also the training time or the average training time was of 0 0.014 uh, seconds, which is uh, lower compared to that of the squeeze net. Uh, oh, and also it is important to take into account that we perform this training in a CPU compared to the GPU that, that we use for the squeeze net. Uh, so in conclusions, well, in this work, we propose to compare transfer learning and the wavelet scattering transfer for pavement transverse cracking detection based on the vehicle vertical acceleration by employing a small sample size. Uh, the results show that fine tuning the squeeze net provided a better accuracy, sensitivity, specificity, and AOC than a regularized linear discriminant analysis trained with the wavelength scattering transform features. However, the squeeze net requires a higher training time and a greater number of parameters compared to the regularized linear discriminant analysis. Uh, as future work, uh, we want to explore the use of nonlinear classification techniques, for instance, a decision tree or random forest that can be combined with the scattering features to perform, again, a pavement transverse cracking detection based on the vehicle vertical acceleration. Uh, these were the reference that I used to, for this presentation. Um, well, that's all for me. Thanks for your attention and time. Um, uh, well, I open to, your, to answer your questions or comments uh, regarding this, this study. OK. Thank you okay. very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now we will have a, a round of questions. Uh, anybody has a question for for Eric? In the in also in the online. I have a question. Okay. Here I'm speaking direction. Yeah. Okay, you can speak. Um, I have a question regarding the input data you enter into the network. Uh, did I understand this correctly? You feed in uh, 207, uh, 220 times 220 pixel images of these scalograms, or what um, do you call them? Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Could you explain the uh, different dimensions of these uh, scalograms? a little bit more in detail since I'm not completely familiar with this kind of um, depiction. Uh, OK, uh, well, the, this is a scalogram. Uh, the scalogram basically tells you uh, how the energy of the signal changes both in time and frequency. So you are mapping these two variables that are the, the time and the frequency of, of the signal, no? how the energy changes, well, how the, frequen the frequencies change over time of the signal, or in other words, how the energy of the signal changed both in time and frequency. So basically, uh, this, uh, this color scale basically represents the magnitude of the energies that are presented on the signal, on the signal both in time and the frequency domain. So you are mapping these two, these two variables with this wavelet transform or with this scalogram. So what we did was basically to generate these images or these scalograms and save them in the in the computer. And, and now, uh, when we have it in the in the computer, what we did later was to resample these scalograms to have a size of 227 times 127 in order to input them into the squeeze net because the the neural network requires that uh, dimension in order to to fine tune it. So that's basically the process. No? First, what we did was to generate like the this scalogram of the signals. And then we save this image in the computer and then resample these images to the size that the network requires in order to train it. I don't know if that answers the question or more clearly. Well, it, it, I don't know if it explains better what we did with these scalograms and the and network training. Okay, we will have a question. Okay, yeah, we will have this question from Dan Molina. He's online. This, uh, he is asking, what is the minimum size sample that can be used? Uh, well, that is a very good question. Uh, I don't know exactly what will be the exact minimum sample size that you need 
to apply these methods, uh, the literature is really big regarding what is the minimum sample size that you need to apply transfer learning or apply the scattering transform. Uh, but uh, one of the things that we also wanted to study is how the performance of these techniques is affected when we increase or reduce the sample size. So what we wanted to do also is to uh, generate like an experiment in which we train the network or the algorithms with different sample sizes and see how the performance of this network changes. It is an open question in the literature. Uh, if you look at other papers that have used transfer learning uh, to determine uh, when they when they are, for instance, trying to detect uh, like an arrhythmia, for example, the authors assume that the that sample size could be sufficient. Nevertheless, uh, one of the open questions that are regarding transfer learning is well, how many data do you need? But also, I consider that it is some it is some open question that is also uh, that affects all machine learning, no? because there is there is isn't like an exact exact method in which you can determine that uh, that the sample size that you have is sufficient for your problem. No, it mainly depends on the problem, and also the number of classes that you that you have for your problem. In this case, uh, we only have two classes. No, we have a binary classification problem, but uh, maybe the performance that we are observing right now could change based on the sample size and also the, the, the number of classes and also the type of data, you know, the, the type of vibration data that you collected. Because in this case, the, the vibration data that we have was from a very particular position within the vehicle. But if you place the accelerometer in another place within the vehicle, maybe you can have a different distribution of your data and maybe that can affect uh, the the sample size that you need in order to achieve at least the performance that we reported uh, in this work. So we hope that maybe it converges to these values, but I hey, cannot Eric, assure thank that. You, thank you very much. I think you answer. Uh, we have now the, the next uh, question, the next presentation. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, if you have your contact, uh, you can share it in the chat room, please. If the, okay, the, okay. the audience have more questions for you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, now uh, we will have the, the next uh, presentation. Uh, the authors are Jay and Jean. And the word, uh, the name's word is Decision Tree Learning Enhancement for Dynamic Data with Disturbance and Uncertainties via Integration of DWT and Nonlinear SVM. Uh, now, uh, if you are ready, uh, yeah, or Jean, I, I don't know who is going to present. Uh, you have 15 minutes, more or less, please, to uh, present your work. Camera, perdón, perdón, okay. Cámara, perdón, perdón, yeah. Okay. Hi. Can you please uh, turn on turn on your camera and, and also your microphone, please? Because we are not uh, listening anything and see you. Ah, okay. Okay. Now we can see you. Okay. Thank you. So I need to start uh, again. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to my presentation. The title is a decision tree learning enhancement for dynamic data with disturbance and uncertainties where integrations of DWT and nonlinear SVM. Outline. 
a quick introduction will be made at first, followed by discrete wavelet transform, nonlinear support vector machine, time domain RCM data sequence classification, frequency domain Raman spectral classification, standard matrix for quantitative classification, and the spatial domain clay flock classification. The conclusions will be made afterwards, followed by the reference. About me, I'm Dr. Zheng Mao Yi. I'm a professor in electrical engineering University, United States. My research interests cover control and optimization with diverse applications of a classical, modern, and intelligent control series on electrical, mechanical, automotive, and biomedical system, as well as signal processing and image processing. I'm an interdisciplinary researcher with expertise on integration of teaching and research. My co-author is another professor in civil engineering at Southern University. Introduction. The technical integration is applied to classify dynamic data with various disturbance and uncertainty. So now the DWT is used to decompose nonlinear data subject to classification into approximation and detail components at multiple life levels in order to extract the intrinsic feature. Nonlinear support vector machine is then applied for data training and binary train decision making as well as learning enhancement. Afterwards, integration of a DWT and a nonlinear SVM has demonstrated feasibility and effectiveness in multiple case studies. Firstly, it applies to a time domain changing the data classification for rapid compression machine. Secondly, it is applied to a frequency domain Raman spectral differentiation. And thirdly, it is further extended to the spatial domain data classification, such as the dynamic properties of clay flux. So DWT actually decomposes the signal into a orthogonal wavelet basis set. It captures both the frequency information and the time information. At each level, the input sequence is decomposed into two components of approximation detail where the inner product of the source sequence with, uh, with the scaling the uh, co uh, wavelet uh, coefficient then sampled by a factor of two. Essentially, DWT covers two filters. Wavelet filter or the detail filter acts as a high pass filter. Scaling filter or average filter acts as a low pass filter. Now given a discrete signal of length m and the scaling coefficient, detail coefficient, scaling basis function, and the detail basis function are shown next to it. The hard wavelet has been a like a children. In the discretizing scaling and the wavelet function are corresponding to the rows of the matrix. As a matter of fact, of fact detail coefficient indicate high frequency information mismatch of the two approximations at the two successive decomposition level. Now, if we want to reconstruct a sequence and it is calculated using the inverse DWT. The approximation component at any specified levels can be selected for binary tree classification via nonlinear SVM training and the prediction. About the nonlinear support vector machine, the SVMs are basic supervised learning models used for classification and regression. The classifier acts as a separating hyperplane. The goal is to derive the hyperplane that op optimally separates a diverse class of data. In our case, k-fold cross validation is applied. SVM conduct decision tree learning using optimal high-dimensional hyperplane that splits the input sequence into two classes. Okay. The vectors closest to optimal hyperplane are support, are support vectors. A distinct separation gap in the between two classes and is formed across the hyperplane. Now, for some complex cases, nonlinear SVM project the data of high-dimensional feature space to linear space via certain kernel function until it is linearly separable. The idea behind is very simple. A feature space can always be mapped into a certain high dimensional feature space where the training site will be separable. We have a number of a typical nonlinear kernel functions, and such as the polynomial, hyperbolic, Laplacian, and the Gaussian. As a universal kernel, Gaussian kernel ensures the global optimal prediction to minimize the approximation errors for classifiers. So this classification involves the quadratic programming uh, optimization. 
we will introduce the least square estimation and to optimize separating, uh, separating hyperplane with respect to the uh, like support vectors. And the, the nonlinear hyperplane is simply formulated as this. And then we will have a nonlinear least square SVM classifier model with the objective function being defined as a quadratic function. And uh, also in, inside this definition, we have our binary class labels for yi. We also have our Lagrange multiplier as well as the pairs. We saw the necessity to explicitly solve the nonlinear function of weighting vectors. The optimal solution can be easily computed by applying the pseudo inverse. So the, case, the first case study is about, about the time domain RCM data sequence classification. Rapid compression machine is a bench testing substitution device for internal combustion engine at the earlier development stage. It is basically hydraulically actuated and stopped to conduct experiment on fuel injection and also on cellular combustion. It has so many advantages, like the direct measurement, the adjustable stroke, and the clearance. RCM operation is highly nonlinear chancing process. These turbines exist together with various types of uncertainties. So the high pressure and the high like, temperature of RCM only uh, occurs within a very short 10 to 20 milliseconds window. The qualitative evaluation of RCM experiment is based on the optically accessible laser instrumentation to inspect the inside of fluid motion and the combustion. And the quality evaluation is based on the computerized analysis and the data. The integration of DWT and the nonlinear SVM is applied to differentiate acceptable and unacceptable cylinder pressure rise rate. And due to the high nonlinearity and also high uncertainty, second level DWT is conducted. So let's take a look of the uh, RCM operation. Its operations are like uh, monitored by lab view audio environment. The front panel simply contains the user interface for data aggregation. The pressure traces and the pressure rise rate are dependent on piston state, uh, uh, speed, also affected by other uncertainty factors and the disturbance. Now we have our acceptable pressure rise rate located on the left. We have the unacceptable pressure rise rate located on the right which is related to certain phenomena we call auto-ignition. For both like a result, and the measured pressure rise rate is shown on top left. Detail component at level one is shown on the top right. And approximation at level two is shown on the bottom left. And the detail component at level two is shown on the bottom right. Now we can make a comparison between acceptable and unacceptable cases. For real-time data analysis and synthesis, and it's critical to make a quick binary decision. As a machine learning technique, SVM enhances decision making. So our nonlinear SVM is used to tra for training and testing where separating hyperplane in the feature space is reached. And we will introduce the maximum and minimum margins of a support vectors, which are shown on the result right over here. The hyperplanes with the margins provides a criterion for data classification and the data like a prediction. The classification in terms of experiment data can be less accurate and convincing than that, that of the approximation at the level two. So the second result, the later is more likely to represent intrinsic data. So let's take a look at another case study about the frequency domain Riemann spectral classification. Redmond spectroscopy is a non-destructive uh, destructive analysis tool for biomedical characterization. It is widely used for qualitative and quantitative analysis at high spectral and spatial resolution. The Redmond shift between the incident lights to the sample surface and the Redmond spec uh, scatter light is equal to the actual energy for changing the molecule's vibrational state. Therefore, the interaction between the incident lights and optical photons and induce the Riemann scattering. And we will produce a two intensity light at the two frequencies we call Stokes and anti-Stokes and the frequency. Simply based on the instant light frequency and the measure the Riemann scatter light frequency, the natural frequency of any sample can be determined uniquely. Now take a look of the Riemann instrumentation. An argon laser has been used. 
together with the spectrometer, optics detectors, nut filters, and band pass filter, as well as the PC software. Once again, integration for DWT and SVM is to distinguish between the normal Raman spectrum and the abnormal Raman spectrum, and in order to enhance the precision and accuracy of classification. Based on the existing normal and the abnormal experimental data, the nonlinear SVM is used for training so that the separating hyperplane in the feature space is computed and uh, using the, like, a Gaussian kernel. The, uh, the separating hyperplane is then used for data classification and the prediction. Now the classification and is less accurate and convincing in terms of the measured Raman spectrum than the approximation at the level two, which represent the intrinsic spectrum. Okay, so now we also want to introduce the quantitative classification. Okay, that as a set of a standard matrix can be like a defined. The standard matrix are set of a quantitative measure to access the overall classification performance of any model. Okay, simply true positive turns out to be the outcomes if it correctly predicts the positive class. True negative turns out to be the outcome if it correctly predicts the negative class. False negative indicates the outcome if wrongly predict the positive class. False negative indicates the outcome if wrongly predict the negative classes. Accordingly, we can introduce like a full other terminology for classification. Accuracy means classification, precision, and recall. And all of those turns up your functions of a TP, TN, FN, and the FP. And now the accuracy indicates how frequent a model classification is overall. Means classification indicates how frequent a model classification, uh, classification is totally wrong. Precision indicates how frequent a model makes the correct prediction of a class. Recall indicates how frequent a model can detect all objects of a specified a specific a class. So furthermore, and the F1 score is also introduced. It turns out to be the alternative measure combining both the, the precision and the recall. Okay. And it measures the class wise performance on how effective a model makes a trade off. Okay. Especially for the imbalanced and unequal class distribution, like our uh, two cases before. F1 score is more popular than accuracy itself. Now we have four cases of RCM and Raman. Okay. F1 score always ranges uh, between uh, like a 0 0.83 to 0.89. Okay. It indicates the model classification is efficient against the unavoidable disturbance and uncertainties. On the other hand, the integrations of a DWT and SVM, and the, they will provide a better classification performance than the SVM itself. Okay, let's take a look at the spatial domain, clay flock classification. This is for the comparison purpose. It is just applied to the more general case with uncertainty, but under relatively low disturbance. So we will introduce a spatial domain example. And the, the mechanical properties and of a clay flux in the aqueous environment depends on the nonlinear dynamic nature of a co a cohesive uh, segments. The salinity is one of the most important properties to determine the bricade strength. Okay. In our case, nonlinear mapping between the displacement and the compression load is tested. In order to distinguish and uh, between the natural flux samples and the synthesis of flux samples, integration of DWT and SVM will be helpful on classification and the prediction. Now, based on the experimental data and approximation at the level two of DWT, the load versus the deformation curves are plotted. Okay, nonlinear SVM can be applied again for spatial domain and data analysis. The actual data are shown in the nicer slides. On the left is about the natural, like I said, the experimental data from the nature flux samples. On the right is something related to the things like synthetic flux samples. Now I have one class map between the nature flux samples and synthetic flux samples. And I'm sorry, uh, your, your time is over. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, now we have time only for one question to, to the author. 
anybody, does anybody have a question? Okay, if not, I can make a quick conclusion. Uh, in the region of DWT and SVF is applied to enhance the decision tree learning. The wavelet analysis is tended to specify types of high, high, highly nonlinear dynamic system with disturbance and uncertainties. In order to ensure the quality of classification, it is employed to reach the well-trained optimal nonlinear hyperplane and enhance the binary decision making. So this technology integration is applied for chance in the data uh, analysis of a rapid compression machine in time domain and the Riemann spectral analysis in frequency domain. Also, this approach can also be successfully applied to differentiate the dynamic data across uh, diverse domains. Comparisons with cases in the spatial domain are also made. Well, the reference are provided in these slides. So that's the end of my presentation. Now, thank you. Any question? Any question? Any thank question? You. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we we have no time for questions. We are uh, on time. And okay. now we have the next uh, presentation, please. Okay. Thank you. This okay, is thank my you very email much address. For your okay. Presentation. We will have your your contact. Okay. Now um, the next presentation is uh, Christian Garcia Uribe and Ernesto Lopez Mellado. Uh, the work is building hierarchical workflow nets for discrete event process discovery. Um, sorry, sorry, sorry. This is the other one. It's Armando Gaitan, Ofelia Begovic, and Nancy Arana Daniel. The, the name is No Decoupled Extended Kalman Filter versus Adam Optimizer in Approximation of Functions with Multilayer Neural Networks. Okay, are you ready? The authors are. Yes, please. We are adjusting. We are adjusting. I have a camera. We don't have. Problem. We don't have. We we can hear you very well. I don't know if it's, you have a problem. Uh, I move to other other place. Even. Sound is sound is from kind of noisy. This is my presentation. Can I start? Good afternoon, my name is Armando Gaitan. I am doctoral student at Cyber State Guadalajara. I have the pleasure of presenting the research work No Decouple Extended Karma Filter versus Adam Optimizer in Function Approximation with Multilayer Neural Network. Here in collaboration with Begovic and Arana Daniel. In this presentation, Pierce the important aspect that motivates the research. A brief introduction, then the two algorithms that are compared, no decoupled extended karma filter and Adam optimizer. Next, experiment carry out and the results of time. And finally, the conclusion on future work. Well, Besides of the architecture, the training algorithm is a determining factor in the success of artificial neural networks. In the application, algorithms of first order, Bayesian gradient, are the most used. However, algorithms of second order information have also been investigated with important results. Even applied in some neural network classes. And different versions of the extended karma filter are example of this case. Into one 
of its approach, the Nordic couple extended calm filter is an algorithm with possibilities of implementation that may be used in certain problems to overcome conventional algorithms. As we know, in image recognition and natural language processing, excellent results are achieved with fish order algorithms. However, there are tasks in which it is necessary to improve performance of neural networks. On the other hand, the no decouple standard camera filter in feedforward neural has not been used for decades. And when it was used, its performance was compared with that of the standard gradient descent algorithm. So today there is an opportunity to compare it with the Adam optimizer, a widely used for its order algorithm. The Kalman filter emerged in 1960 and shortly after the extended version for nonlinear system, and almost three decades later, Singal and Wu proposed using it for the training of neural network. They proved better accuracy and faster convergence than with the back propagation algorithm. The second order in statistical information that introduced the filter reduced the likelihood for local optimus. However, a computational complexity depending on the square of the total number of parameters was an obstacle to its implementation. As Corias and Falcon, almost two years later, faced this problem and they proposed decoupling to reduce the computational complexity. This way is depend on the of the square of parameter number of the group and not on the net. It is assumed that the statistical correlation between some pairs of waves can be disregarded. In the figure of this slide, we have a schematic representation of the covariance matrix of the error estimation, which is key part of the calculation in the Kalman filter. At the left, the original case called global in the decoupling approach. The matrix is then with values different from zero and all of this element. All right, is the extreme case of total decoupling where the matrix is diagonal absolutely. In the middle intermediate case, the coupling for layers and coupling for neurons, uh, where the matrix are diagonal in, in blocks. The coupling for, for neurons is all interest. The coupling for nodes or the coupling for neurons assume that the synaptic way that connect to each neuron are correlated with each other, but not with the ways that connect to other neurons. This level of the coupling seems to be the most natural level of the coupling and a good balance between complexity and performance. In new experiments with neural network perceptual multilayer, this algorithm demonstrated higher accuracy than back propagation and faster convergence, considering a number of For applied, the no decoupled extended Kalman filter consider that the training it makes the estimation of an optimal neural network stationary state as is expressed in equation number one and number two, where data is the state vector conform for ways and bias of neural network, and H is a nonlinear function of network of the process equation with RTV white noise of view satisfying expression number three, and auto equation also with uh, RTV with noise view, satisfying expression number 
number four. The data I must initialize and B also the need integration. In the recursion process of the non decoupled standard comma filter, from which the parameters are adjusted in each iteration, first is calculation the gradient with respect to the parameters of neural network of network case. Then calculate Kalman gain. Next, this gain is applied to the error, larger minus the output for correction of the estimation of parameters. And also is made a correction of the matrix P for next iteration. It is important to say that the decoupling, this operation can be done by program, but in equation A, the scaling matrix or covariance matrix of the output estimation error whose inverse is necessary contains a sum of all groups. The Adam optimizer is an algorithm based on gradient descent and is currently one of the most used in training neural networks. Adam combines RM from and momentum to work now previous algorithms. The first calculation in the iteration is the gradient with respect to the network parameters of a specific condition F. Then the exponential mean of the gradient and exponential mean of the square of the gradient. Next, operation that attenue uh, the bias uh, caused by optimization. Finally, the equation 16 for uh, new values of parameters, uh, where uh, alpha is nominal learning rate and epsilon is a small positive value to avoid numerical instability. Experiment. Two functions are used in the experiment. The field function on one called big is in my lab repertoire and it's frequently referred to series. The function has the exponential term and polynomial terms. The second function, our purpose, called waves with sinusoid terms of degree 2 and degree 3, as we will see later, is more complicated to approximate. The architecture of the neural network is perceptual multi layer with six hidden layers. Each neuron with activation function logistic. The initialization of way is random with normal distribution. And the load function for the technique is the mean of the square error. To set the training algorithms, previous steps were carried out in order to find the most convenient one. However, in general, the value recommended the others and common in the literature. Where the best performance. The only exception is the nominal learning rate of the Adam optimizer is being 500 On the other hand, the decoupled the the update of R is particular. It is calculated with the mean of the error covariance matrix corresponding to the output error. Results. In the result for speak function, the average error percent with no decoupled standard comma filter was five times smaller than with Adam optimizer. And the number of epochs for the same accuracy was almost 14 times bigger with the Adam. In the graphic of this slide, we can relate that with not the couple, the standard camera filter, 
this has practically the inner function. In contrast, on the left, it is easy to detect the efficiencies in the function approximation, especially in red, um, bias, even some intermediate values where the original is flooded. Now, on the left, it shows that the load function converge faster with no decoupled standard gamma filter. The graphics on the right with the target values ordered in ascendant way, the corresponding from the neural network, allow us to see that with that optimizer, the error are bigger in the complete range. And with web function, the average error per set with not the couple of the calm filter was almost six times smaller. And the number of epochs for the same accuracy with the Adam was almost 15 times higher. Like another function on the left are relevant deficiencies in the approximation with Adam optimizer, also a crash and valley and some legend. Whereas we know the cup or the camera filter, good performance. Here, in the graphic on the left, it's very evident the faster convergence with no the couple of the camera filter and higher accuracy at the final of five epochs. The pair of graphics on the right show the error with Adam optimizer prevailing in all the range and good performance with not a couple standard camera filter. Conclusion and future work. Not the couple on the standard camera filter and Adam optimizer are compared using multi-layer perceptual neural network for function approximation. With the two function, not the couple standard camera filter produce a faster convergence and a higher precision. The error with no decoupled standard camera filter is five times smaller, and with this algorithm, is 15 times faster with respect to the number of epochs. We think that no decoupled standard camera filter should be taken up in future research as learning algorithm for multi-layer neural network and other types of deep learning architectures all for different problems. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for the presentation. And now we have time for one question. Does anybody have a question? Ora. Ora. Could you please uh, turn on your camera, please, to, to see? To... Oh. In this computer, I, I have a camera because, because I, I, I try connecting with a usual laptop, but I, I have a connection problem. Okay, okay, no problem. Okay, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, okay, do anybody has a question or also in the in the chat room? No? No. Okay, I have only one question for you. Um I, I don't understand very well why the Kalman filter performed uh, better. Uh, what was what characteristic does that uh, algorithm has that outperform uh, Adam algorithm? The main characteristic. Well, uh, we we think that uh, Kalman filter can have statistical information that uh, Adam uh, haven't. Okay, it's because the statistical information. Okay, I, I understand. Uh, we have a, an online uh, a question. 
it, it is which is the main advantage between the proposed descent algorithm and Adam? Uh, well, I I know the uh, Adam uh, really is mirror uh, in time because the advantage for epoch number is uh, seventeen to to one uh, for uh, Kalman. But a uh, different of one to uh, 35 four times uh, versus Adam. Uh, so finally, uh, times Adam is two, two times better. Uh, but uh, we, we think that there are problems uh, where the Adam Adam optimizer don't don't achieve. Higher, higher precision, uh, uh, maybe uh, with Kalman filter uh, is better accurate. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think it's, it's okay for now. Uh, now we will continue with the next presentation. Now I am correct. It's, it is uh, the, the work by Christian Uribe and uh, Lopez Mellado. The name of the, the work is Building Hierarchical Workflow Nets for Discrete Event Process, Processes Discovery. Yes, can you hear me? The presenters are already to present. We had uh, 15 minutes for the presentation. Please. Yes, uh, can yes. you hear me? Hear me? Yes. Justin here. Justin here. Justin here. Justin here. The screen. What? Please. One more. Ah, okay. Can you see? Excuse me. Can you see me? Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Christian Uribe, and today I will present the work called uh, Hierarchical, Hierarchical Workflow Nets uh, for Discrete Event Process Discovery. This is the content that will be covered in the presentation. Let's start. As a first step, Discovery aimed to obtain a process model that describes the behavior of um, a process based on an event log. The above with mat mathematical representation color Petri nets workflow nets specifically, which allow formal algorithm analysis of business process. A uh, workflow net consists of a start place and final place where the event of ta or task are represented with not scaled transitions. Concepts and articles uh, on this discrete event identification process and process uh, mining methods were studied, such as the following uh, re reusing Petrinus building algorithms and inference algorithms of invariant execution events. The problem statement was described in the following way Given a log lambda produced by an unknown sound workflow net, which doesn't include silent transition, the discovery problem consists in determine, determining a sound petrinet structure using once the transition of in sigma, uh, which reproduce uh, lambda. The place's uh, number is unknown, uh, and the discovered petrinet is structured in two levels, where the transition of level one net uh, represent the petrinet Substructures and the level two uh, represent uh, the Petrinet. Now, a clear objective uh, is the construction of Petrinet's model, models that have certain execution properties where these nets are also easier to represent visually. So, uh, log representation called macro transitions. 
the net of level two, which are com uh, composed through places according to the relation between OS to obtain the workflow net at level one. The approach begins by collecting the relations between the events represent in a log where it aims to finally bundle these activities. These groups or cluster are related considering the sequ sequential relation between the events uh, in the log and finally uh, produce a petronet with macro transition and level two uh, and produce a petronet decomposed in events in the level one. First, we collect the present relations between the events were based on the input uh, log, uh, present a graph like the following build. build. Nets, uh, given the, the established precedents, uh, the causal relations are defined with a sequence of two events. For example, the, uh, the T5 and T6. On the other hand, a concurrence relation is defined uh, as the sequence of two events in both orders, such as uh, T1 and T2. Now, let's start clustering events with constant presence. Truly, a set of events with constant presence is when each element in a set is observed in the same number of times in the same in the same set of traces of the log. The above with a vector uh, a vector precedence uh, published in in other another work in 2020, 2020 uh, the following table that the event T0, T1, T2, T3, T and T4 have the same presence vector. Then Given a log like the following and using algorithms in the article published in 2020, the, uh, the following sets are produced, everyone with constant presence. Likewise, with the use, uh, using concepts from the previous article, uh, we get a connect subgraph are obtained by uh, generating partition uh, as showing in the figures. This connection comes from the causal relation observed in the log be between the events. As can be seen, there is a group event set where draw a projection function uh, of causal relations uh, of the log, and this, these are fragmented. In addition to the previous uh, one refinement, ref, refinement, refinement more is proposed given an execution order pro uh, property. The order and execution property looks uh, for a set where all events are ex executed before the other subsequent events or other subsequent uh, uh, sets of events. This feature is called order execution property. First, we begin defining two sets of uh, concurrent events, LB and RB, that maintain a, a sequence supported by the notion of precedence invariant and subsequent invariant, where each event has a successor set based on the subsequent observed observe in the traces of log. First, Uh, we can observe in the initial record that uh, the trailing edge sets uh, T10 and T12 are concurrent and are always observed before the sets T13, T14, T15, and T16, belonging to the same event set. On the other hand, it is observed that the border events T13 and T15 are all, always observed after the set of T8 to, uh, to T12, resulting in a refinement of this set, uh, C is uh, uh, going to o, two o, always. Then uh, the, the generation of this always partition consists of the following steps. 
Given a set C E S obtain two subsets of concurrent events LB and RB uh, that are causally related and each other uh, and each other, then fragment this C is maintaining the execution of their property where this intersection of the of the unit of invariant successors and predecessors of LB and RB is the OES. Where for each pair of sets of events, it's determining whether they, they maintain a causal relations between them. By the causal relations between the members of each set, uh, as can see in the following graph, where always five events are related with always six events. All the events uh, in the OS uh, are together with um, the, the the set of relation of precedence R, uh, and the concurrent relation from the Petrinet structure, which uh, which is linked to the other OS substructure according to the relation among them. Uh, for instance, consider the OSB5, uh, T9, T10, T11, and T12 uh, relations. Uh, for example, T9, T9 and T10, and T10 and T12 are related with a uh, concurrent relation. Every, every wall block uh, of the OS defines a connected petri net substructure where the events in the block are related according to the causal and concurrent relations. Similarly to previous, uh, the relation of every event in an event cluster CS or OES is built getting a CS or OS hierarchical level. Uh, respectively. Uh, notice uh, the, that to mark a place between two cluster OS, uh, for example, OS 5 and OS 6, every event in the OS 5 uh, must occur before uh, OS 6. It's easy to see that the CS clustering obtain fewer event sets compared to the OS clustering uh, and better fitting model language because this model gives a causal relations T1 and T3, T10 and T13, and uh, T12, T15 compared to the CS model. In conclusion, a method for hierarchical workflow discovery was built with a two levels event clustering approach with a smaller number of transitions or with a shorter circle language, respectively. The relations are inferred between events not observed but present in the log, where discovery method produce a greater surplus of language. As the experiment. First, a workflow net are built uh, with the concurrent events with a pipe tool, as seen in the following video, adding a token in the initial place and running the no, uh, a number of simulations to get uh, a synthetic log. This log uh, is the input to the software developed in Java. and get the model. In other hand, in the, uh, 13, no on the other hand, the same risk, uh, log is introduced into the PROM software where versions of alpha and inductive manner algorithms are implemented producing the following networks uh, respectively. Ah, this video. Mm -hmm. 
these are the result. And it's all. Uh, we we cannot see your your screen, your your presentation. I think um, I don't know what happened. Really, really. We, we cannot. We, we cannot. stop to see your 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 screen. Your ah, okay. Stop. Yes. Oh, is is huh? your screen? Yes. Could you please um, full screen? Uh, yes, right. Mm -hmm. well. We can see you. Um, it's, it's, it's all okay. Yes, it's thank you, Christian, for the presentation. Uh, we have uh, one couple of minutes for some questions. Does anybody have a question? Also in the in the chat. Uh, I don't know if you uh -huh. uh, turn on your camera to, to see you at least at uh, this uh, last yes. round of, of questions. Yes. Uh, I don't know why. Um, let me change. Uh, configuration, configuration displays. Uh, microphone. Uh, sorry, I can see the. Ah, it's in this place. Nice. Uh, here we have a question. We have two, two questions. The first yes. one, no, we have only one question. This is uh, which is the computer cost in time for each cycle? And the second question is which they are the characteristics, which are the characteristics of the hardware use? Uh, okay. The okay. first question, first question uh, about the, um, the complex of uh, with uh, a cycle is correct. Yeah. 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 Yeah, 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 yeah. Ah, okay. Uh, well, in a cycle, um, a cycle re uh, gives a lot of uh, traces in the log. For example, if you exist a trace uh, T1, T2, and T2 related with T1, uh, the 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 log uh, of input uh, of the software gets only the relation between this um, between these uh, activities or events and um, rep give some well, how do you say a set of relations but only uh, gives uh, no errors maybe a construction uh, like a like a cycle with uh, the algorithms of the literature, but specifically uh, doesn't bring uh, a problem. Maybe in the in the hier hierarchical uh, workflow nets, uh, construct uh, or se separate uh, two two events in, in two blocks. And the other question. Sorry, uh, can you help me help me with uh, the other question? I can hear.
second question is about the hardware, the characteristics of the hardware that you use. Uh, a simple computer, for example, this computer is a it's a laptop, uh, Windows, Windows 11. Uh, in this place, uh, have the software. For, for example, this. Can you see that? I ah, know. Ah, no. Can you see the my my window? Yeah, yeah, we, we can see the screen. Thank you. Uh, in this computer, ha I, I have uh, Windows 10, Windows 11, sorry, uh, and I use uh, Java in her, their, their version 1.8, I don't remember. Uh, and in, in this case, I hit the, the log, Run the execution, the execution, and get the following graphs. And get the yeah. Okay, uh, I think this is clear. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Sure. We now have the, the next the next one. It's here. We have the the presenter inside. The next presentation is by Victor Rodriguez, Luis Pizano Escalante, and Omar Longoria Gandara. And the name of the work is Application of Machine Learning Techniques to Characterize Floating Point Benchmarks Using Hardware Events. Okay, thank you, Victor. And you have 15 minutes, please. Okay, thank you. Is it okay where I'm standing for the camera? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here. Um, um, my professors will be doing the PhD and Instituto Universidad de Ciudad de Guadalajara. Um, we are working on uh, doing heterogeneous computing, and one of the first phases is to identify what kind of workloads could go into heterogeneous computing and into the coprocessors. So the first phase of our research is to identify using machine learning what kind of workloads could actually go into this coprocessor. Uh, the problem is, this is the presentation overview, the problem description, the hypothesis, the hardware performance events, the related work, the methodology that we uh, follow and that we try to, to, to go, the results and the conclusions. First of all, computing, it's, the compute is growing in terms of requests all over the world, from cloud to new processors, new coprocessors, and heterogeneous computing. And one of that field is the high accuracy of complex calculation. And this time of arithmetics, it's used or it's it, it has been um, fixed or or applied with floating point arithmetic. The floating point arithmetic has been heavily used in a stock market, astronomy, biology, many fields. Uh, in response to the evolving demand, the hardware development has been creating coprocessors. One of those is the floating point coprocessor. And there are many kinds of floating point coprocessors. Some of ones that we have discovered in the state of the art has been related to RISC-V. New coprocessor has been related to new uh, specialized uh, uh, coprocessors actually for machine learning. But hey, the floating point coprocessor, it's our focus on this investigation. So the question comes, okay, we are uh, working in collaboration with hardware development teams and say, hey, I want to know what kind of workloads could actually stress very well those coprocessors because there is a vast majority of software pieces around the world. And trying to say, I want to run all the software workloads and benchmark around, it's very, it, it, it's unlikely, impossible, and not extendable. So the question is, how can we create a system that tell me if a workload is actually stressing the uh, floating point arithmetic unit by that's important not being uh, not know about the source code because sometimes we receive the workload in the validation phase of the coprocessor, but we don't have access to the source code. 
And we don't want also to instrument, we don't want to recompile and, and instrument the system because it will be very intrusive for the um, system. So the hypothesis that we have is that this problem can be solved using hardware performance events. The hardware performance events are in vast majority of this of the hardware systems that we have in compute. Uh, it, dep it depends on, on the vendor, but for example, for x 8664s we have more than 100 hardware performance events that are there available for us to be written uh, as a software development. So the idea is that we can read those software, those hardware events that actually capture multiple things uh, of the hardware happening during the execution of the software and feed that into machine learning to detect what kind of application actually has similar characteristics to well-known floating point benchmark suites. The benchmark suite that we're going to be using that it's very that, that we know the, the characteristics is going to be a spec CP 2017. A spec CP 2017 it's split it into a spec, a spec rate or a spec speed. And each one of those it's split it into floating point or integer workloads. So we know we have a set of workloads that are very well defined. Um, the hardware performance events are encountered that are uh, obtained by the performance monitor unit. It's a piece of hardware that is there in laptops, uh, servers, multiple computers. The PMU is a hardware component. It's integrated in many processors. And the primary function is to monitor and gather performance-related data during the program execution. We can say, okay, I'm going to execute this workload, and at the same time, I want to gather all these performance events. We can select which one we're going to use, uh, easily configured by the operating system. The PMU tracks events like the numeric of executed instruction, cache misses, branch prediction, and other essential performance metrics. Hundreds, honestly, there are at least 300 of them in modern service. Um, in the related work, it's very interesting. We have found three uh, related works. The number one, since 1992, the SPEC 92 was detected that the floating point workloads was using a lot of um, data catch needs ratios um, in comparison to the integers uh, workloads. Now, uh, that was the first approach. The second investigation, uh, it was um, new uh, it recently in the 2015, I think. Um, they also discovered that they have higher cache miss rate and branch miss prediction. And the question comes because when you want to characterize a power met, a power system, a power supply, a cooling factor or something, it's much more transparent to think what kind of metrics we will be looking for. But for floating point operation, there is no such thing uh, on the current hardware to say, I want, this is the, the PMU counter that measured your floating point operation. It, we have to go indirectly to actually know how to detect this kind of thing. There is not a thing like a sensor for floating points, sensor for integer operations. Uh, so our method methodology proposal consists of the following step. Choosing the workload ter characteristics. Okay, we base it on the state of the art. We, we have a hint that might be on, on, on memory uh, and branch misses and cache misses and so on. So from the hundreds of metrics, we will focus just on them. And th those would be at least seven or nine, which is uh, multi -body, multi um, uh, multiple dimensions. So the second thing is collected performance counter for spec CP 2017 integral floating point. The third one is we want to apply principal component analysis. It's a decision that we, we took to actually visualize easily to reduce the dimension. The fourth one is supplying unsupervised machine learning clustering first, assuming that we don't know none of the spec CPU, not knowing uh, when in reality we know by, by the definition of the workload. And then we will use uh, a supervised machine learning to actually split the data uh, and, and also test if it's possible. And then validate the accuracy of clustering using multiple um, algorithms. So this is the result of the test name. Uh, and it, it has the ID and branch misses, cache misses, uh, intro, instruction per cycle, L1D cache load misses, and precisions. Uh, this is the, risk, the if, if the workload is actually an integer or a floating point uh, workload. Now, when we gather all of them, the, the hardware usage was a uh, server, Xeon Platinum 8180, uh, with 62 gigabytes of, of RAM. It was a, a full server, 62 cores. Um, and and the, the total amount of branch uh, misses, it's seen in blue, cache misses in orange, IPC in green, and red uh, L1D cache load misses. So we can see very good, very good uh, first results from here. 
The floating point operation uh, have actually, and, and it's related to the state of the art, has higher amount of cache misses uh, compared to the integers. However, the branch misses, with a surprise, it's higher on the integer uh, kind of workloads. Uh, instruction per cycles was kind of the same as well as one d cache load misses. However, floating point was uh, slightly higher for, for floating points. Uh, now, we want to know how many dimensions can we reduce. We use uh, explained variance ratio to determine the total amount of principal components. And we detect that with three components in a three-dimensional way, we will have a very good, of almost 90% of, of explained ratio, which will be very accurate to the data that we have with the five dimensions. And then we, by, by definition, by, the, by personal decision, we, we, in this investigation, we decided to go with two dimensions because it was much more easy to visualize at the beginning with just two dimensions instead of playing with three. But it's also possible for future works to go with the three and see uh, improved results. Uh, this is the first result of the PCA. The numbers correspond to the previous slide of the IDs. And the zero or the yellow ones are going to be for integers. And the purple one are going to be for floating point workloads. So as we can see, they are uh, in, in two components. We can see in a split so of, of a ver um, transverse line, which is uh, good for, for the incoming phase, which it will be the machine learning. However, it's not so uh, different, right? When we apply a basic unsupervised machine learning, in this case, we use K-mean uh, with the two dimensions PCA. Uh, they detect the centroids and they create two cluster, uh, clusters A and cluster B. And it was, it was, this is the result. So then we had the question, how do I determine? Because I don't know. Remember that we assumed that despite the fact that it was a spec CPU 2017, we said, I don't know, or I will assume that I don't know if this is floating point or integer. I don't know. I know because I'm proposing the data, but assuming that I receive this data and I don't have any idea about the workloads. So that will be the if, if someone used this in the industry or in pre order application. So for that, we decided on the, on the investigation to use the algorithm of cosine similarity to detect if cluster A has it's actually more of a floating point or more of an integer integer uh, workloads. And the same for cluster B. And the result is that cluster A has a very low cosine similarity for floating point. However, it has a very high for integer uh, uh, workloads, and cluster B has a very uh, high for floating point and very low for integers. So with that, we can define not only cluster A and cluster B, but also put labels. This is going to be the cluster for integers. This is going to be the cluster for floating points. And now, with that information, we can uh, actually validate the, the, the accuracy of our machine learning. The first one is the confusion matrix of the gaming clusters. Uh, we have two, uh, three um, errors. We have one true label as integer that in the predicted was labeled as floating point, and two that was uh, actually floating points, but it was predicted as integer. So we only have three uh, of them. Thank you. Uh, not successful result for the unsupervised machine learning. We can see IDs 10, 7, and 6, and um, as I said, predicted wrongly, and we can see that 10, uh, 7, and 6 are mostly on the boundaries of the of the cluster. We can draw uh, a boundary of the clusters. They 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 are very close um, to to the boundary. That that's the the idea that we have. That it could be the the, the reason to validate the accuracy. Uh, we use um, uh, flawless malloc score algorithm to do the 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 validation of of the in this case of the super, uh, supervised the supervised machine learning was uh, uh, applying this way. So from the 100% of data that we have in the PCA, uh, in, in this case, we will assume now uh, that we know that the, the kind of operation, if it's integer or floating point, zero or one, uh, um, and then feed that into the decision tree algorithm. Then split the data, 80% for training, 20% for testing, and the 20% will be unknown. The 80% of the data will be something that will be fitted into the decision tree. And the results are very good. With uh, when we compare of the risk of to to sustain the reason why we use PCA with four dimensions, we had a score not bad, uh, sixty nine percent, so almost seventy percent. But with only two dimensions, we help a lot to the decision tree to achieve almost hundred percent of accuracy. In that case, uh, the conclusion: this study showed the success of utilization of machine learning and and hardware performance counters related to the cache operation to identify 
if the application heavily relies on floating point operation. Uh, for future work, we want to extend this not only for floating point and integer, but for detecting if a workload is using machine learning uh, algorithms or, for example, databases. So the next set of experiments that we have uh, uh, ready, uh, it's with, we, we in the same hardware, we run a bunch of workloads for machine learning and a bunch of workloads for cache databases. And the results, it's using the same methodology. Uh, the chosen power metrics effectively differentiate between floating points, so the state of the art help us a lot to actually conclude something in, in this new area of machine learning. They say, hey, with those hardware events, with those minimal set of hardware events, it's good, it's possible to differentiate uh, interior and floating points. We will see if those uh, future works, if those will help us also for machine learning and databases. And the integrated arithmetic class exhibit higher branches, misses, and IPC values, whereas floating point workload displays elevated cache misses and L1D cache load means. These metrics collectively create the, the gap between clusters in the plotter. So the proposed methodology achieve a very good accuracy with four dimensions, uh, with, with two dimensions, better than with four. And it, we see, uh, again, that PCA actually helps a little bit to the machine learning. Uh, this uh, finding is part of the confidence of application of this methodology for a broader range of application. We focus now on spec. We will use it in future with other kind of workloads. Uh, this approach exists, uh, very good promise, detecting mm -hmm. our performance event and help the machine learning model. So the, the, the good thing that we like about this methodology is that it's not intrusive. So we can apply for more uh, scenarios, for example, in a cluster of, of uh, cloud, uh, Amazon and so on, where the people can go and gather the performance metrics uh, from some specific uh, virtual machines and then uh, see if the workload could actually fit into a specific accelerator and instead of try and error and, and so on. So that's it. And these are the references. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Now we will have uh, some questions. We have time. Oh. Yes. Okay. In your benchmarks in the floating points and the internet integer uh, problems, do you have the same uh, amount of data? To compare them, uh, the total amount of test cases for floating point uh, we have slightly the similar. I think that it's one or two more for floating points. Uh, well, I mean, the, <laughs> how big is your data for the floating points, and how big is your data for your interior parts? These are all the data that we have. Floating kilobytes, gigabytes, megabytes. No, no, it's just a stable. So we, we run the workload, and at the same time, we said to the to the perf tool, please collect these performance metrics, and they collect just this. So during the execution of these B weights, we detected 0.13 percentage of branch misses, 9.6237 of percentage of cache misses, uh, IPC of 0.28, that's another percentage, and 5.4 um, percentage of L1 cache misses. Uh, well, how? Uh, how many data does this test are producing? Because it can fit in the M1 cache and you will have any misses if it's. Okay, okay. Uh, it depends on each one of the specific workloads. For example, we have one that do weather forecasting, compilers, uh, image processing. So it depends. I, I don't know what, what data do they uh, analyze internally. Yeah. I actually don't have the source code of each one of those. Well, okay, thank you. Uh, online, uh, online. Uh, anybody have a question? Okay, I, I have a question. I see the 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 the, the values of these features because are the, the the feature space is four dimension, mm -hmm. and you reduce to to two mm -hmm. by PCA. But uh, did you uh, use some normalization? Uh, Function because are very different. Yes. Yeah. 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 In the source what, 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 kind of, what kind of min max or, or, or Z score? You don't remember. I don't remember, but it's in the paper. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But also, and um, in the in the other plot, yes. you have the 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 two dimensional space. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it's better the other one. It's sure. the same, but I think okay. Yeah. Uh, I I noticed that you have um, a lot of uh, 
odd layers and Camins is very sensitive to, to odd layers uh, because it is looking for the mean value and the mean value is 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 sensitive to odd layers. Uh, maybe you can use another clustering approach, more robust to, to odd layers, yes. or to remove the odd layers from your data. Uh, after uh, making the normalization, make a, an odd layer removing. Yes, absolutely. Maybe it's, it's going to, to improve the, 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 the clustering approach. Thank okay. you. No, definitely. It's it's a good it's a good uh, feedback. Thank okay. you. Yes. Okay. Anybody have a question? Okay. Okay. That's all. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Victor. Thanks. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have the our <laughs> perfect. Uh, we have the last one presentation. Is is online also? Oh, one. Okay. Uh, the the authors are Ruben Hernandez, Ramon Garcia Hernandez, and Francisco Jurado. And the name of the work is Control of an in under actuated mechanical system where reinfor in reinforcement learning compensation. And now uh, we can start. We have you have uh, 15 minutes, please. Please. Okay, thank you. Uh, can you see my slide? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, the name of this presentation uh, is Control of an, an Underactuated Mechanical System with uh, Reformed Learning Compensation. Good afternoon you to all. Uh, I hope you are well. And this presentation is by Dr. Ramon Garcia Hernandez, Dr. Francisco Jurado, and by myself, Ruben Hernandez. So, uh, the outline of this presentation uh, first. I will give you a brief introduction of the topic of the of this research. Uh, section two um, provides a description of the mathematical model of the system that we will be studying. And section three, uh, the proposed methodology is discussed. And the section four present the simulation results. And finally, in section five, uh, present the concluding remarks. Okay. Um, under actuarial mechanical systems present a challenge for engineers due to their limited number of actuators and highly nonlinear dynamics. And this kind of systems appears in robotic application and aircraft, spycraft, uh, underwater vehicles, marine vehicles, mobile, mobile systems, and many other mechanisms. Uh, the main characteristic of these types of systems is that they have a few fewer actuators than degree of freedom. Um, in this case, we choose the rotary inverted pendulum or uh, Furuta pendulum, uh, which is a two degree of freedom under actuarial mechanical system with a single control input. So these mechanisms is a benchmark benchmark prototype to test various linear, nonlinear. Uh, intelligent control techniques like fuzzy controllers and te techniques based on uh, adaptive neural network compensations. Uh, the main objective uh, have been explored in the literature for the control of this type of system is the swing up, the stabilization, and the trajectory tracking problem. Okay, uh, on the other hand, machine learning is an emerging area of artificial intelligence which has gained prominence in recent years. Uh, Reinformed learning is a subfield of machine learning that deal with the search for optimal sequential decisions. And these algorithms have exhibited significant potential in controlling some kind of systems, offering a distant approach for the conventional control theory. So there are previous words that use reinformal learning algorithms to control under actuarial mechanical system, but they only consider uh, parametric uncertainties and do not consider the case of the external disturbances. So the problem statement uh, in this work is when a reformal learning agent trained in a nominal environment may experience performance degradation when confronted by, with external disturbances. So an alternative, an alternative to deal with this uh, drawback 
is to combine the reformed learning with other control approaches to increase the robustness of the control policies. So the main motivation of our work is to use deep reformed learning as a powerful tool to approximate a nonlinear system by interacting with the system while learning to perform a given task. Then this knowledge is the use in a hybrid control scheme to improve the policy obtained and at the same time to compensate for unknown dynamics under external disturbances. Uh, in this slide, the mathematical model of the rotary inverted pendulum is described by the Euler Lagrange equation 4. The states of the system are the position and the angular velocity of the horizontal arm and the pendulum, uh, while the only input signal is the control signal applied to the horizontal arm. So um, the proposed methodology in this work, we use the deep deterministic policy grading algorithm to stabilize the rotary inverted pendulum. And the main idea of the reinforcement learning methods is that the agent receive an observation signals, which represent the states of the system in function of this observation, the agent generates an action that uh, generates an action that influences the system and transition to a new state S prime. Upon taking actions, the agent receives a scalar reward according to a predefined reward function R. So uh, this algorithm is a uh, is well known. Uh, reforming, reforming learning method used to solving continuous action space problems. Uh, the deep deterministic policy gradient algorithm is based on an actor critic uh, architecture. So the actor network is responsible for generating the policy and the critic network evaluates the quality of the generated action by estimating the expected community reward based on the current base on the current policy. Uh, okay, to stabilize the pendulum in the upward position, it's necessary to make some consideration to design the reward function. One way to do this is to define the maximum values that, that the states can take according to their physical limits in order to set the conditions required for the learning phase. So uh, in this case, we use a reward signal uh, based on quadratic terms. Uh, which simplifies adjustments and enhances the chances of training a successful policy. Okay, um, the next step is tuning the hyperparameters and choosing an appropriate neural network architecture is crucial for the success in the learning process. So in this figure shows the actor critic network architecture. Uh, in this case, for the actor network, um, the input is the observation vector of the signing that provides the system conforming the states of the proper system. And the two intermediary hidden layer consists of a fully connector layer and activation layer respectively. So the output layer on the other hand, just the, just the action or the control signal. So for the critic network, the inputs are the observation vectors and the action taken. So the three middle hidden layers are fully connection layers and the upper layer is the Q-function value. So the activation, the activation functions employs as a rectified linear unit, the hyperbolic tangent and the linear function. Okay, um, as we can see um, in this slide, uh, the initial condition for the learning phase of the agent, uh, as said as shown. So uh, the initial position of the pendulum starts each episode uh, taking values of plus minus 25 degrees randomly. So during the learning phase, the agent interacts with its environment described by the mathematical model of the rotary inverted pendulum. So um, 
In this case, uh, the optimal policy for the agent is found uh, around in 647 episodes with an average reward criterion less than uh, minus 100. So in the figure, we observe that the agent uh, reward during the initial learning phase is erratic due to the exploration. But with the progressing learning, the reward function uh, rises and is close to the anticipated community reward. reward. Um, okay. Um, once the agent has learned to perform the task, we use it to compensate for unknown dynamics in a control scheme previously reported in the literature. In, in previous work, a feedback linearization controller with adaptive neural network compensation is proposed for the control of the rotary inverted pendulum. Uh, in our work, we propose to demonstrate that reformed learning based compensation is superior, superior uh, to adaptive neural network compensation. So we propose to replace the adaptive neural network compensation by the, by the previously trained reformed learning agent. So in this slide, uh, we show the simulation results. Uh, as mentioned before, the reformed learning agent is designed to stabilize and hold the pendulum in this vertical position, which becomes a complicated task, task in the presence of external disturbances and, and even more so when no linear friction is present. So to this end, the numerical simulation are conducted in MATLAB Simulink, and the initial condition for the pendulum position is set at 25 degrees. So in the first case, case uh, we simulate uh, the nominal case. In the figure, we observe that the controller based on the reformal learning compensation demo demonstrates reduced overshoot in both cases in the angular position of the arm and in the angular position of the, on the pendulum. In addition, the reformal learning based controller have less overshoot in the control signal. So in the table, the results indica indicate the superior performance of the reformal learning and the reformal learning based controllers over the adaptive neural network compensation controller as evidenced by the root many squares indices. Uh, it is worth noting that the reformal learning controller gives the best results in the steady states uh, in the nominal case. So the second case to analyze is the perturbed case to evaluate the robustness of our proposal. The second case to analyze, um, we set uh, an external forces is introduced to the control signal uh, in the steady state for 0 0.1 seconds. We observe a substantial change in the angular positions of the pendulum and in the R position. Uh, and the proposed controller based on reformal learning compensation exhibits robustness effectively maintaining the position pendulum uh, in the equilibrium point. So according to the table, the controller based on reformal learning compensation demonstrates greater robustness in comparison with the reformal learning agent and the adaptive neural network compensation controllers. And furthermore, the reformal learning compensation controller exhibits reduced energy consumption, consumption in presence of external disturbances as indicated by the root mean square performance index. So in conclusion, uh, this paper um, shows the application of reformal learning agent trained with the deterministic policy gradient algorithm as a com compensation element in a hybrid controller to stabilize the rotary inverted pendulum. In, a, in absence of external disturbances, the reformal learning agent show better performance in stabilizing the pendulum position with respect to the control is based on adaptive network compensation and reformal learning compensation. And when, ex when an external disturbance is present, the reformal learning based compensation gives the best results compared with the control based on adaptive neural network compensation and the reformal learning agent by itself. Uh, we conclude that reformal learning approach provides a better compensation in presence of external forces than the adaptive neural network compensation method. As a future world, we will address the trajectory tracking problem and under actual mechanical system. So this is some reference uh, used to, for this presentation, and that's all for my part. Uh, thank you for your attention.
Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. Very interesting. And now we have some minutes after finish this session for some questions. A question also in the chat room. Uh, we have a question here. I have a question. Uh, just for your uh, control policy. Well, because I see that most of these uh, um, for neural techniques are more like aneuristic techniques. So I'm curious in, for example, in your policy lot you have your white matrix. How do you can assure, for example, the stability in the system? Well, if okay. you have this criteria like the economic stability and all of this, and if you have this uh, definite positive matrix like you show in your control policy, I don't know if you can uh, change the presentation in this part. When you... Okay, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, well, uh, our approach uh, is not um, um, focus on uh, stability or uh, Lyapunov stability. So we use uh, uh, the the, uh, the adaptive neural controller that we use to compare these controllers uh, is designed with a Lyapunov approach, but we don't know uh, use uh, this uh, this approach. We use uh, replace uh, the adaptive neural network reported previously in the literature, and we replace we this replace this adaptive neural network by a uh, reforming learning agent, which is a different uh, approach to approximate nonlinearities or nonlinear systems. So we don't uh, work over uh, in. Uh, uh, Lyapunov uh, stability approach. So this is our our difference. Uh, well, well, okay, yeah, I understand that you, you, you don't do this approach, but that, that's my question. Lyapunov stability guarantees this stability, and I see that maybe can happen that you reinforce the learning can maybe do some weird things because I see that your weight matrix. I, I know I'm not sure it always update uh, positive values. That's that's not like my question. Okay. Oh yeah. Uh, the adaptive neural network compensation uh, in in the, the previous work. Yeah, this is uh, use uh, adaptive logs to update the weight matrix. Yeah, by uh, these adaptive logs, uh, adaptive logs are obtained by Lyapunov stability. In our case, no. In 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 our case, you um, we uh, let me talk for me. We, in our, in our case, we uh, just, uh, okay. we just um, select RAM uh, by trial and error, the, param the hyperparameters of the reinforcement learning agent. So uh, maybe the, the stability of this approach uh, in the sense of the Apunub uh, stability Maybe perhaps it's an upper problem. Yeah, it's possible uh, to to make some analysis uh, in in the Lyapunov, the Lyapunov, uh, the stability of Lyapunov. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, anyone more questions? No. Okay, so well, I think that we are finished now. Um, clap for everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, and we have tomorrow more two more two more sessions about computer science. Okay, see you. Yes. <laughs>